Hey everybody, my name is Kyla. Welcome to my channel where we talk about the stock market and the economy amongst other things. Today I want to talk about this idea that we don't need to destroy the economy in order to save it. Adam Osmek published a piece in The Atlantic that bo basically boiled down to that idea. We don't have to destroy the economy in order to fix it. And of course, I really love that idea, right? Like I talk about this all the time, the idea that things are relatively okay, that we can have an economy that is okay. There's nuance, of course, you know, rate hikes did help. We needed a bit of a slowdown, but the general idea that we don't need unemployment to rise to cause a recession, to get inflation down is really important. We don't need excessive pain in order to get progress. It's still kind of icky, though, because like there's so much going on, right? Like Americans often don't realize how good they have it, despite all the problems that we do have as a country. And there are so many. Jamie Dimon recently did a really wonderful speech at the Economic Club talking about how lucky we truly are, even with all the issues that we do have as a country. Economically speaking, which, of course, is not necessarily always a good indicator of how people feel, things technically are getting better. And there are three general responses that you'll get when you tell people that things are getting better. Number one, I'm still struggling to make ends meet. Real wages have been stagnant and the cost of living is still sky high. And then number two, I could see that. I still don't feel quite comfortable, but I found work relatively easily despite layoffs in my industry. And then the third, which is my personal favorite, you're an idiot and a liar and I'm perched precariously on a stack of gold bars. These responses matter in their own way. And when we look at economic data, it's looking pretty decent. I mean, ADP came in today beyond hot. <laughs> It's still hard though. Um, you know, the market is repricing a recession. I really like Connor Sen's shorthand for recession odds, comparing Carnival Cruise line stock and SOFR futures. The stock is up 100% and SOFR futures have moved 150 basis points, meaning that market pricing odds of a recession have fallen from 60 to 70% to 15 to 20%. And we have had sort of a soft landing. So Goldman Sachs lowered their 12 month recession probability to 25% because they felt like we've seen enough in terms of labor market rebalancing, AKA they feel like the labor market has chilled out enough to where they should be able, we should be able to avoid a recession and therefore get to a soft landing. But as Mark pointed out, um, we kind of had, had, we've had a soft landing. Like we've sort of achieved that we've had peaks of 14.7% unemployment down to, you know, what it is now, which is three and a half percent, 9% plus inflation down to what it is now, no decline in real income, two plus years of job growth. If it isn't a soft landing, what we've had, that term is essentially useless. And okay, okay, like the economy is okay, but people are still not vibing. Michael McDonough, who works for Bloomberg, published an interesting chart that walked through economic surprise, hard data versus soft data, and stated that it suggests the actual economy is doing better than expected, but economists think that people's opinions of the economy are better than they really are. The economy is good, but not as good as other people think the economy is. Um, and then the final point here is people talk too much. So Neil Dutta wrote a piece for Insider stating that Wall Street should chill with the recession calls because they're spooking everybody out. He writes, growth pessimists seem to lack logical consistency in their views. Their arguments are constantly contradictory. G growth, growth is holding up, which means the Fed must hike interest rates even more, which is bad for stocks. Actually, growth is weak and the Fed has already hiked interest rates too much, which is bad for the economy and stocks. You can't have it both ways. One thing has to be good and one thing has to be bad. So as Derek Thompson said, the U.S. has the fastest growth rate of any G7 country, and the U.S. has the lowest inflation of any G7 country, and Americans hate it. The economic reality. So things are okay. Things are never really great, uh, but they're okay. There is, of course, still the individual experience. One in five Americans are spending over $1,000 on a car payment, uh, which likely feels really, really bad. But all of this could be a lot worse. And, you know, I don't know. I feel like I end up back here in every newsletter, every video, just sort of gest gesticulating uh, broadly into the space around me and trying to do like a mass psychological analysis on the populace, which is sort of simply silly, but that is economics is doing psychological analysis. But there's one thing I keep on circling back to. People are so anti-establishment that they forget to stand for something. So there's an article in The Guardian about polystyrene and how her inspiring sensitivity should be the true legacy of punk. The author writes, Polly wasn't someone who speculated on society's downfall from the sidelines. She lived and embodied these modern day tensions in the space between black and white, using her voice in a wild and noisy way. She occupied a very real outsider identity. This knife edge existence paired with a, such a sharp wit and vision meant that she saw through cracks in society.
people on the sidelines. A lot of people who will just yell and like not do anything about the things that they're yelling about, which is very annoying to me. And it reminds me of Toni Morrison and the source of self-regard. Fascism talks ideology, but it is really just marketing, marketing for power. It is recognizable by its need to purge, by the strategies it uses to purge, and by its terror of truly democratic agendas. It is recognizable by its determination to convert all public services to private entrepreneurship, all nonprofit organizations to profit making ones, so that the narrow but predictive chasm between governance and business disappears. It changes citizens into taxpayers, so individuals become angry at even the notion of the public good. It changes nature neighbors into consumers, so the measure of our value as humans is not our humanity or our compassion or our generosity, but what we own. It changes parenting into panicking, so that we vote against the interests of our own children, against their health care, their education, and their safety from weapons. And in effecting these changes, it produces the perfect capitalist, one who's willing to kill a human being for a product, a pair of sneakers, a jacket, a car, or kill generations for control of products, oil, drugs, fruit, and gold. As no opinion once said, the thing Americans want most is for other Americans not to have stuff. Like there are things like the UPS strike that are deserving of the same wrath that these that these people are showing to economic metrics and each other. Like imagine if we were collectively like labor unions and worker rights rather than being like, I'm wronged by everybody. Like do something productive. Be productive with your anger. And I think that there are three main things that are driving some of the cultural weirdness. Uh, they're drilling outside of my house again, again. Um, so when we talk about economic activity, <laughs> they, they've got it covered for weeks now. And I think there are three main things that are driving some of the cultural weirdness. Constant availability, but ever-present loss. Excessive optionality, but feeling as there is no choice. Desire for a sermon, but no community. Constant availability, but ever-present. As James Palmer said, one thing I'm not certain older entertainment people have adjusted to is that legacy movies like Indiana Jones and Star Wars are more available and less special. When I was a kid, an Indiana Jones movie being on TV was noteworthy enough you made sure to watch it. Things are always there. When things are always there, it reduces some of the value, but it's also less special. Anytime you want to watch something, you can. There's no effort, but there is also loss. Because of the constant cycle, we move through shows and media and people quickly. People get bored, or as Wilcher wrote about, it gets too expensive to produce things. As Ethan Mollick said about Disney Plus removing a movie for cost-cutting reasons, everything the early open internet hackers were worried about turned out to be true. If you can't have your own local copy of something, it can be disappeared. Any corporate online platform can become a wall garden overnight and your content taken away. Only Wikipedia will endure. There is a constant threat of instability and fear in the most of the things that we interact with beyond just TV shows. Will Twitter die? Will TikTok die? Will there be another pandemic? We have so many things to choose from, but there is no promise our choice will stay with us, and that creates a weird cognitive dissonance. Of optionality, but feeling as there is no choice. A lot of, but then we have a lot to choose from. As this said, anyone else experienced losing 95% of their interest in TV and movies at some point in my 30s? All talk of X Y Z being a great show just became empty background noise. IDK, I'm not proud of it. I think it's probably bad and definitely not universal, but maybe I'm not alone. Some of this is the repetition of stories, uh, aging, other time demands. But I do think that there's a lot out there, but nothing sits right. All the stories are commercialized in service of brands rather than culture. The New, York, the New Yorker published a piece about the Barbie movie and Mattel ripping all its IP to the big screen, and there were so many good quotes. A nostalgia play like Hot Wheels is seen as safer than the original concept. The mandate for an audience recognition has pushed artists to take increasingly desperate measures, including scrounging up plot lines from popular snacks. Our priority is to make really good movies, movies that matter and that make a cultural footprint. Our second priority is to make sure that we do no disservice to the brands. What we consume is branded. What we interact with are stories that have been told, and they demand consumption from us. Gerwig's Barbie, for all its gentle mockery of Mattel, has already paid dividends for the company. A $50 doll resemb resembling Robbie, as she appears in the film, unveiled in June, has sold out. So has a $75 model of the stereotypical Barbie's pink Corvette. Brand collaborations have yielded a glut of Barbie-themed offerings from candles to luggage and frozen yogurt. As Toby wrote in Life After Lifestyle, all culture is made in service of for-profit brands at every scale and size. This leads to desire for a sermon, but no community. 
And when all we interact with is branded stuff, it feels bad, it gets lonely, the content is not good, money is spent, it does not matter. Amazon's $250 million show came in behind Barbecue Showdown. People aren't really getting what they need from the content that they consume, so they turn to other forms of entertainment, like the 50% of Vanguard investors actively managing their own money. This is largely a function of risk appetite, of which there seems to be plenty of, and a lot of people treat the CNBC hosts or different financial podcasts as some sort of sermon because we want church and we don't have it anymore. But we still don't really have community. We have excessive individualism, all for me, none for thee. And there's a really fun paper called Praying for Rain where prayers for rain only work in places where the probability of rain is increasing in the length of the dry spell, so these places have more religious belief. When it hasn't rained in a long time, it's more likely to rain, therefore prayers for rain after a long time, uh, with no rain, can translate to those prayers working. But the root of that is belief and time and trust and community. Um, I biked 100 miles this weekend, it was hard, <laughs> and one thing I kept telling myself was to focus on the process, not the result. If I kept on thinking about the 100 miles being the end state, and we were only supposed to be going for 80, that was not right. Like that, It was the end state, but not really. It mattered a lot more how I got there versus dragging myself to the end. It's more fun to be present during than to be thinking to when it's done. And there's a scene from Before Sunrise and Before Sunset where one of the characters says, I believe if there's any kind of God, it wouldn't be in any of us, not you or me, but just this little space in between. If there's any kind of magic in this world, it must be in the attempt of understanding someone, sharing something. I know it's almost impossible to succeed, but who cares really? The answer must be in the attempt. The answer must be in the attempt. We get caught in stuff that happens at the end that we so often forget to simply exist maybe availability, optionality, sermons, etc. could all be solved if we were just more present to the moment, more reflective, more there for one another. This is from this this quote from Terry Davis is really marvelous. What's reality? I don't know. When my bird was looking at my computer monitor, I thought that bird has no idea what he's looking at. And yet, what does that bird do? Does he panic? No, he can't really panic. He just does the best he can. Is he able to live in a world where he's so ignorant? Well, he doesn't really have a choice. The bird is okay even though he doesn't understand the world. You're that bird looking at the monitor and you're thinking to yourself, I can figure this out. Maybe you have some bird ideas. Maybe that's the best you can do. The bird is okay even though he doesn't understand the world. And of course, a name of the poem. Language is tragic, reaching for a grace and stumbling, repeating, and in that staggering moment, discovering a grace beyond all reaching and made of it. Thanks so much for hanging out. Thanks so much for spending time with me. We don't have to destroy the economy in order to save it. And I know that's like unpopular with some people for some reason, um, but we don't. We, we don't. So, uh, I've been struggling a lot this week with like comments and people just saying all sorts of things to me. Um, but I will keep on talking about this idea until it doesn't make sense to talk about it anymore. Where it's like, okay, well, maybe we do have to destroy the economy. But as of right now, um, we don't. And I just hope it stays that way. Thanks so much for spending time with me. Thanks so much for hanging out. I hope you all are doing okay. I'm on Substack, Twitter, um, so Threads. Instagram. This is a podcast as well. And yeah, I'll talk to you very soon.